So hello, thank you for coming. This is the last session for today, so thank you for surviving. Uh, hopefully I won't take uh, a lot of time. So dear Scala lovers, do you know what Scala love is? Yes, so for those who don't know, Scala Love is a podcast about Scala programming language and its community. It's all about you people. And I'm the host, Oli. So I hope to share some Scala Love with you today. So let's get started. Uh, as I said, I'm Oli, and I work as a solutions architect at 47 Degrees Consulting Company. Uh, we are focused on functional programming using Scala language and Kotlin and all related technologies. And we help our clients. And one of the areas that we focused on is web services. And we build a beautiful framework for you called Moo in order to help you to build your microservices painlessly. So when I was preparing this presentation, initially, I thought I would give you an introduction to service-oriented architecture, to microservices, to APIs, to REST, to HTTP or serialization formats. But then I realized that you don't have to know that in order to use our library. It's so simple. You don't have to know anything, actually. It is functional, but you don't have to know that. Have you ever had a protobuf headache, like you want to change field, you want to remove field, you want to add that, and then you have binary incompatibility, and then all this generated code. Adam just gave a talk about concurrency, and he was talking about things like Monix, uh, Akka, or Zio, and that's what I want to use, right? But what I have now is that the generated code from my Proto or Avro has future, the future to worry about. Nothing else. And um, Mu allows you to abstract over it. So I want to go ahead and show how you do that. So in order to define your first microservice, all you need to do is use these two annotations. Message, this is the uh, tagged case class, which eventually will be serialized, deserialized, sent via network, and this is, will be your request or response and the service annotation, which you put on a trade on your algebra, and that's how you expose an operation, and it will be publicly available via network. That's simple, that's it. No more uh, protocol-specific definition. No more thinking, oh my god, I need to put a tag. Is it used, is it not? Nothing like that. So, and I encourage you to use this Gitter A template to start to build a new microservice on your local machine right now, because that's 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 super simple. Two com come on, uh, two comments is between you and uh, server, but you need to publish um, part of the server so that the generated code would be available in the client as well, and then you run the server. So I, it didn't start, did it? Now, here you go. So, and the second command for the client, uh, which will be using the published artifact inside. So this example is just a simple ping pong game where client assigned a ping and uh, server response was pong. Very simple, I, I don't know, super easy. But uh, let's take a look at how we build microservices. When you're building microservice, what you really want to do is focus on your business logic, on the core, the thing that makes your project unique. But instead, you have to deal with transportation layer. You have to look at the protocols, RPC, HTTP, message brokers, something else. You have to look at the serialization, JSON, Avro, Protobuf, Thrift, maybe something that you build in-house. Uh, before 47 Degrees, I worked at Expedia. And uh, we had our own serialization format called Tesla. It's open source, you can take a look, but um, you don't have to. Basically, when you add a comment there and you add a white space, it will uh, result in a new version. Not so funny. 
also, you need to look at the ways to profile your system. Log in, metrics, instrumentate, really know what's inside the system. And you spend time on integration with all these frameworks which support HTTP or whatever you choose, right? And the problem is uh, you need to decide what to use at the beginning, at the earliest stage of the project. And then the cost of the change will increase after a while because you deeply into your original choice. And then say you're building your new shiny API. What do you do? Research, right? You Google it. And you can find that uh, it's widely discussed over internet. And you start to think, OK, the first thing is the uh, message size. I want to send as less bytes over network as possible, right? Then how fast is this serialized, serialized, and things like that. But then the requirements that you have initially might change. The business might go in another direction, or you might misunderstood something, and now here you go. You know that uh, Avera would be more compact, but it's too late. It's really too late. So we are trying to solve this problem. But before I show you how to solve this, I want to point on a few things. So if you take a look at the interface definition language, although they are very different from each other, they have uh, things in common. The first thing is uh, a message. Another one is color types. Uh, each IDL supports color types, then optional values, call products or enumerations, nested types as well, collections. And it's interesting in Prod above there is no actual connection, but uh, collection. But uh, there is a keyword repeated, which means that there will be uh, repeated records which eventually you can combine and create a list of it or whatever you use in your language. It's not necessarily a scholar, right? And the services, the list of operations w which uh, will be exposed for your server. So it's not specific to Prada or Avro. It's also true for Thrift, for OpenAPI, JSON API, JSON schema, for all of them. But still, there, there is a difference. Let's, let's take a look at how, how we actually encode the protobuf. So each protobuf field has a type annotation and a, um, field tag. Field tag is a number. And if you take a look at this example, it, uh, field A has a type integer and number one. Then uh, field name type of string has a tag two, and they has to be unique. So these tags are a compact way to refer to a specific field without having to uh, spell out the full name of it. So in JSON, for example, if you call the field A and then rename it somehow, then instead of A, one byte, it will take as many bytes as, as, as long um, as the length of your new name. So you will send uh, more information over a network, whereas it's just a name. It doesn't have to be the same. So how encoded information looks like. The first byte, uh, 0, 8, is for uh, tag and type combined. Then uh, it's followed by the value. So 96, uh, 0, 9 is uh, 150 in uh, uh, variable sized integer notation. I'm sending a hi to Martin. Which Martin can you guess? Then uh, 12 is the same thing for string and uh, its tag, uh, followed by the size of the string, Martin, six letters, and uh, number six, and then encoded. So overall, uh, it took us 11 bytes to encode this. So let's take a look at Avro. Immediately, you can see no tags. 
And in fact, this format does not use, um, does not encode type information or tag information. And it has downside. Both reader and writer has, have to have the same uh, schema. Otherwise, they will not be able to read the message. It's just impossible because you don't have enough information. You don't, you don't know type, you don't know tag, you don't know name, you don't know nothing. But on the other side, it took us 10 bytes. This is a simple example. I want to point that it's only two fields in the very short message, but it's already 10% difference. It can be more or less depending on your data, but uh, if you count that you have like million requests per second, then you can understand that this is tremendous difference. And that's why it's very important to pick uh, the correct data serialization. So, of course, I did not cover everything, but I, I just wanted to, you to have some intuition why it's important. And uh, there is a great article about uh, protocol comparison written by uh, Martin Klepper, I believe. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, check it out. Inside Mu, we use two libraries, PB Direct and Over4S, which allows us to uh, serialize directly from case classes, from Scala classes to byte string. So we don't have to uh, use protocol different dot proto files or AVDL files. It does exactly the, ex the exercise that we did uh, manually. It does it automatically. But uh, I'm also running another podcast in Russian about Scala again. Yes, yeah, I I love it. <laughs> Whatever. And uh, one of my hosts um, started to write this library called Zhukov. Zhukov is a marshal uh, from Soviet Union, and it's because it's marshaler. It's a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he got frustrated a little bit that PB Direct was. Um, it, it is. Uh, it depends on uh, Google Protobuf library, uh, which means that it serializes everything into byte stream. But what he wanted is to use ACA HTTP which does not depend on byte stream, so he would need to uh, transform that or whatever, do map mapping, and he didn't want that. So he started this new project, uh, and he's a, a big fan of zero dependency libraries. So it just serializes everything in array byte, and you can then uh, transform that for whatever you want. Very flexible, but it's like early stages, but still, uh, he uses a macro derivation instead of like generic programming, which is used in others. And if what I said does not make any sense for you, uh, there is a talk given by Nadav Summit uh, last year in New York at Scala Days. He's a creator of uh, Scala PB. He was talking exactly about this problem, how to uh, write a library which will... Um, Serialize Scala classes into byte string, and he covers uh, runtime reflection, which is slow and painful. Uh, generic programming, shapeless, then um, macro annotations, and uh, <coughs> another example is serial. It's kind of abundant, but it's a good. Uh, example of using Scotic library to uh, deserialize and serialize script. So let's go further. Now, when we are almost experts, <laughs> we know that memory matters. <laughs> now we want to take a look at performance. So at 47, we asked ourselves 100 times what to use RPC or HTTP. HTTP or RPC, to be or not to be. And uh, we built, you probably asked the same question yourself, we built a project called Metrifier, which is available under 47 Degrees GitHub, uh, which is benchmark, uh, which compares HTTP endpoint versus RPC proto endpoint and RPC ever endpoint. 
yeah, gRPC can use whatever serialization format you give it, but your business is to, s to provide a marshaller. Zhukov. So here we can see, it's on my local machine, that RPC with Proto is much more uh, faster, is much faster than others, than even Avro. Avro is still twice as fast as uh, HTTP REST endpoint. This HTTP uses HTTP 4S. Um, others use Mu, of course. But I, I want to point that it does not mean that HTTP REST should be deprecated. There are still use cases, there are technologies which make it uh, better for usage, like cache, a lot of others. So this is example on uh, uh, running the same thing on the Google Cloud. Maybe it's more fair. RPC is almost the same, still different. It's, it, it's a fairly simple project. Probably everyone at least once uh, had written it. It's like create person, create, get person, get info for person, get list of person, compose all of them. We're a functional program, we like composing. We should check composition. So that's how painful or how long the investigation usually takes. And then you realize, okay, now I'm absolutely sure I'm using RPC with Protobuf, but then something changed and you were like, oh my God, no, impossible. I, I already stuck with Protobuf. See, this service annotation has one parameter, Protobuf, I'm stuck. I'm sending love letters, it's in Protobuf. <laughs> yeah, so, and this is a trick. This is a trick. How you change that for to Avra with me, or simple. I'm actually, I don't know, I'm impressed. I haven't seen that before. It's so easy, I, I just change one, one uh, parameter in annotation and here you go. I can take an advantage of uh, smaller sizes of messages, right? Again, sending love letters. Bye bye. What about rest? Rest with me. Relax with me. Take a break with me. Huh? I thought we, we should we should say uh, something about library. Like, have a fantastic day writing more Scala while not writing RPC stuff. Not taking worry about this. So say you have something which you already exposed via RPC using our right? And you want to expose the same thing with HTTP. It's oftentimes it happens when you migrate something, when you have different clients, one of them wants HTTP, another one RPC for legacy problem or for whatever other things. And uh, we have another annotation for that. HTTP. So now it is available where uh, HTTP. All you need to do here, I want to point that the red lines are something uh, from Mu, generated by Mu or part of Mu uh, library. So here, uh, it would generate a route and a client for you, so you can use it and provide a host and a port and write your business logic. Hello, I'm Oli. And that's all you need to do HTTP stuff. That's fascinating, isn't it? So I want to uh, make an overview of what Mu does. So on communication layer, as you saw, we support gRPC and REST API. Uh, on serialization, JSON, Avro, and protocol buffers, and it can be easily extend. Metrics, it is important to know what going on with your system, right? And it's really easy to integrate with Prometheus and Drop Wizard, which are the most important things over here for metrics, I think. Then security, streaming. Yeah, streaming. 
we want to use FS2, right? FS3 already, I don't know. And one X observable. And schema definition, if you, for some reason, need Proto or FADL file. So far, we didn't look at code much, but I want us to know how to actually implement the service, so let's take a look. Uh, it's a simple example with which takes two integers and sum them and return it, right? So, predictably, you need to write a business logic. Just sum them and <laughs> drop inside of nothing fancy. And here, uh, you need to provide implicit evidence that will be used uh, later on. Uh, mass service dot bind service is generated by Mu. And uh, it provides a service definition of what methods w you have, uh, what types of parameter it takes, and what it returns, your request response and the method name. Add service, just add that to drop that so that would be uh, available for um, request registry. Then uh, you build a server from this config and drop it inside gRPC server.server, which provides a graceful shutdown for a server. So this, this is all you need to write your server. So the blue one is something, your business logic or your configuration that you have to provide. The red one is uh, something generated by Mu. The rest is more or less boilerplate. But in comparison with other solutions, it's much less. So now we have a server available on this port. We want to build a client as well. Of course, you need to provide a channel on the same port, same host, then again, generate it code, client, which you pass a port connection information and you uh, receive a resource of your service. And resource is the class from cats library. It uh, manages resources so that they would allocate, they would be lazily allocated and it will get rid of it once it's no longer needed. And this is your business logic. You just say, I use this service and call a method on it. It just happens to be that it's the only method, but it could be something different, right? That's it. Server and client. So testing. Can you imagine? No, someone can actually imagine uh, enterprise <laughs> system without testing, but we're not like that. Uh, <laughs> yes. So there is a method with service channel in mu RPC testing package, which allows, which gives you uh, um, in memory running instance of ser of server, so that you could test the uh, communication with client without having um, any type of side effects. Here we pass a function uh, to check the result, the blue one but it can be anything, it can be abstracted. But the point is that it's in memory and very convenient. And it's all possible because we use tagless final notation, which abstracts you from affect and you focus on your business logic and can check everything without uh, messing with network. So you will never see your uh, test failing because of network issues or anything. And if you're not familiar with tagless final and testing with tagless funnel. I grabbed a few links. I really like a talk by Luca. Uh, he gave it at Lambda World 2018. And he's talking exactly about this, how tagless funnel helps to test stuff. Then I need to promote my meetup, sorry. <laughs> I'm running meetup as well in Bellevue, uh, Washington, USA. So come over if you're from there. And uh, John DeGos gave this uh, live coding session, refactoring FP to the max, refactoring from the imperative style to functional programming to um, tagless final, step by step. 
it's interesting. And that's all based on this paper of Alek uh, Kiselev, Tegla's final, where he introduced the uh, approach. But it's uh, trending. So if you're writing Scala, you probably want to know about that. And please Google. There are a lot of articles, blogs, talks uh, about that. So it's easy to find. Anyway, so say you're working with other teams which use other languages. I don't know why they would do that, but <laughs> use everything Scala. Yeah. So, uh, and you, want, y you were given a product definition and you want to do, to do uh, Scala classes from it. So there is a way. Um, Moo has a SBT plugin which allows you to generate exactly the same type of definitions that we saw before with annotations and everything um, from ever or product, or there is a way around if you are having someone who's writing in, oh my god, JavaScript, you're giving them a product file using this plugin. It has two comments. And it's all possible because we have another project called Skewmorph. And uh, in the beginning, I was talking about communalities that uh, all these schemas, uh, all these uh, ideals have, like messages, option type, blah, blah, blah. And it's canonical schema definition. And going from this canonical schema definition, we can um, generate other definitions. And it's based on the recursion schemes. So it's very abstract. You don't have to mess with traverse if you want to add your uh, IDL. You can go ahead and just say this type maps to this type in canonical schema definition in skewmorph. Again, if it doesn't make a lot of sense to you what is recursion scheme, uh, please check out the first episode of Scala Lab with Valentin Casas. He's basically obsessed with uh, recursion schemes. He's a maintainer of Scala Z schema and uh, gave a bunch of talks about that. And uh, in show notes, you'll find a lot of uh, useful links to that. Also, uh, check out Drosty. It's, it is used inside Skewmore for recursion schemes. Then uh, I want to wrap up with uh, answering the question why why we wanted to build that, right? We wanted to build something that will allow you rapid uh, API development, just like that. You have your algebra and you want to export that, just do that. HTTP, here you go. Very easy. Then we wanted it to be flexible, evolvable. We want to adapt to changes that we have in our business logic, right? Then modular, the magnitude of features that Mu brings is huge. We don't want to create a mass dependency hell in your build. Um, so everything is modular. You just add the modules that you want to use. Monix, FS2, Netty, OK, HTTP, something else. And it's very extendable. Again, because it's modular, five classes, you know. So you can add your uh, own serialization format. Just need to provide a way how to serialize, deserialize, and then the rest will be done for you. Or new transport. We have on our roadmap Mu Kafka and Mu Cassandra projects. So soon, I hope soon, you'll be able to use that to with other type of transport. And testability is functional programming, right? Everything is testable, reliable, so uh, it's easy to test. That's what we wanted. And it's open source. You know, uh, we use a lot of things in this project, like uh, macros or tagless final, super fancy uh, recursion schemes. If you want to work on them, just we're always working contributors. Or better, we're hiring. So you can be paid working on such an amazing project, huh? <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. <laughs>
Yeah, and thank you. Please uh, check out the Mu website, harikandes.io slash Mu. Also, we wrote a bunch of blog posts about it on 47degrees.com slash blog. Follow me on Twitter, <laughs> Oli underscore Kitty. And uh, as I said, I run my Scala. I host Scalalas. Uh, dot ru, also my meetup. Everything for you. Thank you for listening. Uh, <coughs> okay, so uh, I have a few questions about the macro mechanics uh, of this library. So first of all, um, there's a lot of micro annotations, and I wanted to ask if these annotations have support for type parameterized uh, case classes and and CD keys, so ADDs in in general. And also, um, there's a reflection on interfaces going on in, in these micro annotations, if I understand correctly. So, do you have any ideas or or plans on how this is? Uh, how how uh, how is that go how is that going to work in spite of SCA three coming? So, are there any possibly migration plans or vision? So, um, the first question is um, how our micro annotations work with parameterized classes, right? Yes. Yeah. So the question is simply, can you put an annotation on a type on a case class which has a generic, will it work? So for now it won't work, but we're, it's basically also because um, IDLs have their uh, limitations, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to uh, explain, uh, describe that, define that in IDL. But we're working on that and uh, hopefully we will come up with some Link or whatever, in uh, some kind of encoding or add options, not <coughs> options from Scala, but options in uh, uh, the IDL proto have them. So this is the first question, and the second. Uh, that was about reflection on interfaces done in macros, and how's that? Uh, how do you plan to migrate this to Scala three? Because <laughs> it looks like these are these these things are going to be missing. Absolutely, but. Uh, there is time to go and solve the problem. <laughs> Lovely, yeah, <Okay>. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, that was a great talk. Increasingly, um, clients and servers are using WebSockets, um, particularly allowing servers to push out to clients. Uh, is that addressed, or is that uh, you know something you could put in Mu as well? Uh, it's not addressed, but it can be. It can be put. It can be oh, modified. Uh, actually, if you're using gRPC, so I, I actually. Mm -hmm. If you are using gRPC, it also supports streaming. I don't know yeah. if you're yeah. supporting streaming, but yeah, you can. Def and then it's it's, uh, yeah. If you're doing REST calls, you want to do. WebSocket. Yeah. So you go from H from from HTTP to WebSocket. You do a protocol change. But if you are doing gRPC, your client is able to stream to the server using the stream technology that you you are using your gRPC. I, I want and to add that. It and has then I, my question is: when you are using gRPC, which streaming can you use? Can you can I choose yes. Monix or Monix Observable or, or yeah? Okay. You, you can choose them, but also it, it has some limitations. If you use RPC with, say, Avro, which does not have notion of uh, uh, streaming in the language, then it's it, it just not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it has limitations still, but for a prodder and gRPC, uh, it works fine, and you can choose. And then you choose the the yes. streaming technology. Yeah. Behind. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Stay happy, guys. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you.